two scripture readings today. The first is Psalm 104, verses 27 through 30. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. This is the word of God. And now our second was going to be a little reenactment too. Our second scripture passage comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 11. Hear and see now the word of God. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, He whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was merely referring to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but he was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, 
Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Two years ago, we entered the wilderness. That was our Lenten theme that year, and it wasn't long before we realized just how appropriate a theme it was. Of course, Lent usually starts with Jesus in the wilderness, the start of his ministry in most of the Gospels. It's a time of testing and self-examination, and the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness line up nicely with the 40-ish days of our season of Lent. John's Gospel, however, doesn't have the wilderness and temptation story. Jesus' ministry instead begins with a wedding and wine, kind of the opposite of the wilderness. And yet, the wilderness is here. Our reading, which ended at verse 44, is part of a larger story that continues through the next chapter with the anointing of Jesus' feet, which was alluded to in our reading. When Jesus calls Lazarus out of the grave, it's a moment of crisis for the religious leaders. They say, if we let him go on like this, many people will come to believe him. The tensions have been building all along, but this is the final straw. This is the point where the religious leaders officially decide that they are going to kill Jesus. As a result, Jesus steps back from public ministry in Jerusalem, and he withdraws with his disciples to the city of Ephraim, a town in the wilderness. The wilderness is the in-between space. The space between Jesus' final sign and his final return to Jerusalem. Our wilderness is an in-between space. Now, a few years removed from what has been and what was normal, but still waiting to see what will be. We are not just waiting in this space, we are living in it. And it is a deeply uncomfortable space. Time and space are getting more uncomfortable for Jesus and his disciples, too. Just before this story, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem when the people there were about to stone him. And now, as Jesus suggests that they return, his disciples try to talk him out of it. Thomas, who is the one we often call the doubter, speaks up in faith. He encourages the disciples to come on the journey even if it leads to their death with Jesus. When Jesus approaches, Mary comes to him first. If only you had been here, he wouldn't have died. But even now, In this in-between space, Martha acknowledges that death itself will not stop Jesus. Mary, Martha gets Mary, who levies the same complaint, Jesus, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's a moving and heartbreaking series of encounters, and in the midst of it, Jesus weeps. But why? He knows what's about to happen. He knows that this story will have a happy ending. But still, he's greatly moved and deeply disturbed. Maybe his tears flow for love of Martha and Mary. Seeing their deep anguish, Jesus sympathizes deeply. 
This makes sense, and it is something of a comfort because it tells us that God is not unaffected by human suffering. Maybe Jesus also cried for Lazarus, even knowing that Lazarus would soon be seated next to him at a meal, a loss this intimate hurts. Jesus' whole ministry was about inviting the world into abundant and new life, into relationship with God through him. Could someone who's in genuine relationship with others be callous to their pain or unperturbed by their death? I don't think so. Maybe Jesus' tears flow because his own final days felt so close. He knew this was the beginning of his end. Maybe he knew that there was no coming back from this, that once he raised Lazarus, this would set into motion his official death sentence. Or maybe Jesus kept thinking about the anguish of his own death that would bring to those who loved him. I don't think I'm afraid of my own death, but it breaks my heart to think about leaving behind mourning loved ones. Maybe Jesus had just reached his limit, which would be understandable given all that he had been through. He was in constant conflict with the authorities, and that was increasing. And the last time he had been in this area, he was almost stoned. He's been on a mission from God, and he hasn't stopped moving. And so maybe he just finally hit that point of emotional and physical exhaustion, the kind that comes out in tears. However we look at it, for what should be a happy story, the overwhelming feelings of the story are not happiness, but sadness and loss. Even in this story, which ends with life overcoming death, death remains a central character. It's inescapable. This is a story of life and death, of faith and despair, of restoration and loss. And we find ourselves with Jesus in the in-between of it all. We are Easter people. We believe that death and destruction and the destructive forces of this world have been conquered by Jesus Christ, even if that isn't our current earthly reality. We believe that God created all that was and is and is to come, that God created all and called it good. And we are working toward an end together that will bring all of creation back into God's final promised reign of peace and justice and love. We believe that our current reality is not the final reality. And that the hope we have in God's promises helps give us strength to continue pressing on. We believe all of that but we aren't there yet. Here in the in-between, we have lost or we are losing people we love and we weep. Here in the in-between, we find ourselves on the precipice of climate catastrophe and we weep. Here in the in-between, there is war and violence and people who are dying for speaking truth to power and we weep. Here in the in-between, injustice and inequalities impact every area of our shared life together, and we weep. Here in the in-between, there is still so much suffering and pain and loss and instability, and we weep. We are in that wilderness between Bethany and Jerusalem, between death and resurrection, between the way things are and the way they should be. And this is where we live, in the wilderness. But we do not live here alone. 
We are members of a community, of this particular community, which is just a small part of the body of Christ. And we are members of that great cloud of witnesses, the communion of saints who have responded to the invitation to relationship with God in Jesus Christ. We are here because we were invited to come and see. We're here because we were invited to come and abide. We're here because God called us. And we can stay in the difficult place of wilderness because Jesus is here with us. Not to keep us from the pain and suffering, but to weep with us. This is a story with a happy ending that still doesn't feel happy, but it feels real. It feels real because even in the presence of Jesus, we have questions. It feels real because it's life and it's death, and the two are inextricably linked. It feels real because deep tears and ecstatic joy are often bound together. It feels real because while we don't know where we're going, we're just trying to follow Jesus. This story also gives us space. It gives us space for weeping and questioning and mourning deep loss. And the season of Lent gives us space to do the same because now we are on our way to Jerusalem. We are on our way to death. We know that Easter Sunday is coming, but that even when we get there, the wilderness journey won't magically come to an end. And so perhaps instead, we get to know our wilderness surroundings. Maybe our eyes can adjust to see and receive the blessings that can be found in wilderness. Death may be all around us, but abundant life is there too and Jesus is with us. Perhaps this table is the best illustration of this great paradox, abundant death, abundant life and death coexisting. The memory of Jesus laying down his own life, holding nothing back, and the awareness of him now standing as host and offering love and grace and abundant life in this meal. The memory of a meal that was shared and shaped by love and relationship on the very night when those relationships were strained and even broken. And while this table looks small, it extends through time and space. And the portions we share are just a taste, and yet we are filled. This is the table of life in the midst of death. Life overcoming death, love overcoming hatred. This is our oasis in the wilderness. As we make our way through these wilderness days of Lent, what space do we need to make for weeping and grief? We can sit here a while together, mourning the death that is so pervasive and celebrating the life that keeps breaking in around us. And we can affirm that in life and in death, we belong to God. And because of that, we can abide in the wilderness, knowing that Jesus is here. Amen.